I titled this morning's message, Turbulence. And so here's the definition. In meteorology, it's the irregular motion of the atmosphere. I can remember whenever I was nine years old, we were in a 747 jet. We were flying to Singapore. My dad was over there. We were moving to Asia. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this big old plane started hopping and bumping and shaking. And people were like going all over the place. And I can remember looking at my mom with these big old eyes and saying, what is going on? And she said, it's okay, honey. That's just turbulence. It's just some pockets of air in the sky. You know, and so I guess my definition of turbulence would be commotion in the air. You may not really get my title. I think you will, but I'm not talking about a physical commotion in the air this morning. I'm not talking about a physical turbulence that would cause a plane to move around in the sky. But instead of talking about a spiritual turbulence, one that would cause things to shake in the spiritual atmosphere and tries to cause commotion. Truth be told, God's going to do some shaking. God has already caused things to shake. He will continue to, and ultimately, in the, towards the end, He's going to cause some things to shake. As a matter of fact, if we look at Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> before we go there, though, would you do me a favor and put up the words to that last, I think it was the last song. I think it was. It had the purple background. I'm bad with names of songs. Was it, what was it? Worthy is the Lamb? Gee, ba- the one that says bow, that we would bow down before Him? It, talks about that worthy are you to be worshipped and all that would you do? and light of the world you came down into darkness that one. can you throw that up there real quick <clears throat> sorry I kind of sprung that on you fast let's be patient that's that's a uh, fruit of the spirit patience amen, amen. amen. Yeah. you don't have to pray for patience I mean if you want to love the Lord you're going to have to deal with it. Sorry, man. I threw that on. What's that? Yeah. Light of the world. You step down into darkness. Open my eyes. Let me see. Here I am to worship. Yeah. There you go. All right. Sorry. Like I said, I'm bad with names. I'm trying to work hard. Uh, you just start at the beginning and we're just going to scroll through real quick. Y'all just bear with me as we do this, please. I know, this kind of breaks things up. We're in form of them. Light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see. So spiritually speaking, I'm just saying, like, I didn't, none of this is ever planned. And to be truthful, I don't, half the time the Lord just puts something on my heart to preach. And I don't even know where the scriptures are necessarily going to come from. And so when I'm sitting here, all of a sudden he starts dropping scriptures in my heart. And all of these, these, these lyrics in this song... To some extent, they show up in the message, not necessarily always the way that you're going to see them in the song, but still the concepts are there. And this is another thing that I'd like to kind of mention from time to time whenever I talk about the church is supposed to sing, sing the word of God. It's supposed to preach the word of God. One of the things that I try to explain to people whenever they kind of come new to our church or people that come in and they're like, well, if you try a little bit more modern music, you might be able to fill the place up. That is in my message also today. If you try to, to tr- some new songs, then maybe people would like your church a little bit better. But what I'm trying to say is, is that the problem with the modern church is that it's not preaching the gospel all the time. I'm not saying that there's not ever any new songs that do that, but a lot of the new songs don't preach the gospel. They don't, they don't get, they don't really describe what the word of God is really talking about. But this is a classic example that the world is full of darkness, but Jesus, the light of the world came into the midst of darkness. And when that light enters your heart, you're now able to see with spiritual eyes. Next, look at the next verse for me. Okay, beauty that made this heart adore you. That, that's just a good word right there. Go to the next verse. Hope of a life spent with you, though. You saw that at the bottom? I wanted, a, that's in this first scripture that we're going to say. It may not say it exactly that way, but it's saying the same thing. And you're seeing a repetitive pattern in the scripture of these similar type concepts of like light coming in. Like even David said in the Old Testament, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You, you see persistently a common theme that runs through the scriptures that talks about the fact that man can't see, but that God will illuminate man's eyes. God will, through his word, allow man to see. 
and then right here, an eternity to be spent with you. You see that concept over and over again. I'm not, I didn't use this scripture, but part of that idea is just this. I always used to love the scripture. Abraham looked for a city. He was a pilgrim and a sojourner in the land. He looked for a city whose builder and hands were God. God built this particular city that Abraham was looking for. That's a, it's an eternal city. And, and that's just one example. Okay, so next verse. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. We're going to talk about bowing down a little bit today. It's going to come in a different context. But, it, but the opposite of what we're going to see in this verse is that we're supposed to be bowing down to the Lord. And so I just it's just interesting to me whenever the Lord gives me something to preach. And then all of a sudden, I know we don't have that many songs in this church, but it never fails. They don't use the same ones every time. When I'm sitting there looking at these lyrics, it, it makes me realize no matter how it comes out, whether you like the message or not, I know that the Lord spoke to me and he wanted me to preach on this particular thing. So we're talking about turbulence. You can go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Thank you, Manny. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 28. We're talking about turbulence and commotion and the shaking of things. It says right here, you are coming to Mount Sion and into the city of the living God. There you go. Hope of a life spent with you. Mount Zion is another terminology for the mountain upon which Jerusalem, one of the mountains upon which Jerusalem sits. But this isn't talking about the physical Jerusalem. This is talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. It says, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Truth be told that this heavenly city is made up of a myriad of God's creation. It's got angels. It's got Old Testament believers. It's got New Testament believers. And in this city, this is what you need to know. The general assembly, uh, which are written in heaven. Did you know your name is written in a book? Amen. And to, the, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. But there's a lot of theology in that right there. You know what, I'm, what I mean by that is the word just men is where we get the word justified. And in order to be justified, what it means is you had to believe in God's plan, which was his son dying on the cross, and that that blood cleansed you. And now God says about you, he declares that you are justified. Truth be told that right now, if you are saved, you are innocent in the eyes of God. But guess what? There's one day you, you're innocent in the eyes of God. God says that you're innocent, but he says that because of the blood of the lamb. Not because you do it right every day. Come on, somebody help me out here. Not because you get it right every day in every circumstance and every moment. But instead, he says that declaration based upon the fact that you put faith in what he provided. But there's coming a day that you're going to end up in this this heavenly city, Jerusalem, and on that day, those just men, their spirits will have been made perfect. Amen. Come to completion, come to maturity, come to fulfillment, no longer with sin, the sin nature now eradicated. That's going to be a glorious day. He says, uh, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. You remember what, remember what God said to Cain? What happened to your brother? His blood cries out from the ground. Abel's blood was crying a different message. It was a righteous blood. Abel was a person that went for the sacrifice that God had already instructed the people that it required the shedding of blood. But Abel's blood was crying out for a different message. It was a message of judgment. May my blood be avenged. This is a better word that the blood of Jesus speaks. It's a, it's a word of grace. It's a word of forgiveness. See that you refuse not him that speaks for if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth. Talking about the old covenant, right? The word still came from heaven. God gave the word from heaven to who? Moses. He gave the law to Moses and Moses on earth spoke and they refused to listen to the one that spoke on earth. But now he has promised saying, well, he says right here, if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. In other words, they, they didn't listen to the one that spoke on earth. Much more shall not we escape if we turn away him that speaks from heaven. Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the father. The eternal word 
who was represented by the law of God that was given to Moses. Now the word became flesh. He died on the cross. He ascended to the Father. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. This is the literal word that came from heaven. And if we don't listen to that, there's a, then there's a, there's a problem. <laughs> He goes on to say, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made. I, want, I pulled this scripture up mostly to talk about the fact that God shakes things. That God has been shaking things. He, he shakes kingdoms. He causes kingdoms to fall. It says things that are made by man. There's a lot of man-made things on this earth that we look to, that we even look up to. Yes. Things that are made by man aren't going to last. Yes, right. Even things on this earth, sometimes some men aren't going to last. Right. The Word of God even talks about the fact that the belief and the faith of some will be shaken. The Word of God says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there will be a great falling away right. that will take place. Yeah. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So once again, there's coming a day when this man-made stuff is going to be shaken and removed. But the promise spoken is that for the people of God who endure to the end, they will inherit an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken and it will not be moved. But I got to tell you that until we get there, we're here. And here there's another form of turbulence. That's kind of what I want to really talk to you about this morning. Another form of turbulence that's in the air. I've used this scripture a lot. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. I know I like to use a lot of scripture. I hope you're good with that. Yeah, and I like to break it down. I can't just stick to the part that I wanted you to see. i got to look at the whole thing. That's just how I am. I don't, I, you know what? I'm going to quit apologizing for it. <laughs> and Gail fussed at me. My, my father-in-law been fussing at me for a long time. One time Gail sent me a message. Dude, you need, she didn't call me. Dude, dude, dude. You need to stop saying you're sorry. Amen. And I'm not Amen. sorry. Amen. So preach it. Amen. Praise God. And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. It's talking about the word course there, the course of the world's all together in the Greek. It's eon. It's where we get the word eon. It's describing an age. Can I tell you that since the fall of man, there's a certain course that the world has taken. And it's described right here according to the prince of the power of the air. See, we're talking about air. We're talking about atmosphere. We're talking, talking about turbulence and commotion. The prince of the power of the air, that's talking about Satan right there. That's talking about the devil. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Since the fall of man and man's inheriting a sinful nature from Adam, the spirit of the evil one is the pervasive spirit in the atmosphere. And he is causing through his demons and his fallen angels to cause the disobedient. Now, really what this is talking about, the truth is, is that you and I, as the children of God, can also commit acts of disobedience. But the context here is really describing people that are of the world, people that have been disobedient towards receiving the truth of the gospel. It's important that you understand that because that's really the essence of my message, that the world believes a different thing than what it is that you believe. You can put yourself and if you think and listen, you somebody in here like. I don't know. I'm not going to call out. Some people in here may think that I'm talking about them because I might know them, but I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about every last one of us. If we connect ourselves close enough to the world that doesn't know the Lord and we spend enough time with those people, if you think that their ways aren't going to rub off on you, then I'm going to say it real loud. You are a fool. We are a fool. If we think that we hang around with the world enough and, and, and provide enough companionship with the world and the ways that they think and the ways that they speak and, their, and, and the ways that they perceive the way operations and daily living ought to take place and instead we aren't spending the time that we need to in God's word and in God's presence, we are a fool if we think that they will not begin to influence us and slowly and surely separate us from the truth that is in the word of God. It says right here, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. He's working 
in the world, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. That word conversation, I've told you this before, it's an outdated word in the English. It doesn't mean what you and I would do if we were talking. It doesn't mean us talking. It means the way you live your life, right. how you handle your business. You and I before Christ were just like them. Before you gave your heart to Jesus, you and I were just like them. We were walking in the midst of darkness and the truth be told that we were uh, being influenced by the prince of the power of the air, by the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. In times past, in the lusts of our flesh, and that's what the world's living for, their flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. That's all they care about is what makes them feel good. Now, we've already talked about this last week, but Christians fall to that too. And sometimes it's not things like fornication and lust, sins of lust and sins of sexuality. Sometimes it's just whatever makes me feel good, whatever I want to do. If you get on my nerves, I'm going to treat you like a whatever today. I'm going to treat you however I want to. And there's just no repercussions. That's just, that's just how I am. And that's what you get today. And trust me, each and every one of us, sometimes if we're in a bad mood, right? But thank God the Holy Spirit will deal with our hearts and he'll, he'll remind us. Of who we belong to. Amen. He says, uh, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. Quickened. You were dead. Oh, King James. But he gave you life. Amen. By grace you are saved. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, that's a beautiful thing that in the mind of the Father, you and I are already in that eternal city. You and I are already in that eternal place where we're going to live, that, that, that heavenly Jerusalem that we talked about earlier. In God's mind, it's already done because now we're seated in Christ. It's a fulfilled work. Amen. We're in Him. But the truth is, is that we do have to go through the process until we get there. He says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. So the course of this world, I guess, once again, to remind you that I would say is the ongoing direction since the fall of man. Some of the common things that we just talked about in that scripture, because that was a lot of stuff that we talked about. We talked about the prince of the power of the air. You know, he has power. We realize that, right? He's not supposed to be able to exert his power over the believer because in Christ we've give, been given victory over him, but he has power to influence. He influences through his spirit that works in the lives of unbelievers. That's the world. We used to be them, but we've been bought. Amen. We've been bought with the blood and we are now been given promise that we will be partakers of an eternal kingdom. And even though there's turbulence in the air, we have an anchor for the soul. I want you to know that. Amen. And you can go to Hebrews chapter six, verse 19. Y'all can read it real quick if you want. But what it says is that we have hope as an anchor for the soul. It's both sure and steadfast. And which enters into that within the veil. We have an anchor for the soul. What this is talking about is it's talking about Jesus, the high priest. He entered into that behind that veil where only the high priest could enter in once a year. And Jesus, after he offered himself up as a sacrifice, fulfilling the sacrificial system, he now is seated at the right hand of the father. And even though there's turbulence in the air, this is the point I'm trying to make. Even though there's turbulence in the air and even though there's waves, there's an anchor for the soul. Amen. You can hold on to Jesus no matter what you're going through. You and I need to be reminded of that. And we, we don't have to be moved. Amen. Like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. A root system connected to Jesus. Amen. That will cause us to, to hold on to the Lord. He is immovable, and in him we are secured in the immovable kingdom. But hold on now, because the prince of the power of the air will not give up that easy. He's always prowling, always looking to cause some commotion and some turbulence. He's looking to influence the children of disobedience and cause them to walk the course of the world. And that's, once again, really what I'm talking about this morning. The way he influences the world, the way that 
he influences the world system and that the world system influenced by his spirit is attempting to cause confusion and throw people off the path. I want you to, I want you to get that this morning. Now, I have to tell you that this is nothing new. The Spirit has been working through the course of human history. The Spirit has been working in the lives of world leaders. I believe it's Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. I didn't have it in my scripture, but I always, I always used to like this. Uh, well, take a chance and throw it up there real quick if you want. I, I think it was. Hold on a second. It may not be. Let me just look real quick. Just bear with me. No, that's where as a tree planted by the water was. <laughs> so, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. I always used to quote this scripture back a long time ago whenever y'all first started coming to church. <laughs> Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That, you know what the heathen, once again, is the world. It's the people that don't know God, right? The this is the children of disobedience right here. And it says, uh, why do they rage? And, call, and, and do a vain thing. Next verse. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and his anointed. Uh, so what does that mean? It mean? I'm talking about world leaders right there. I'm talking about world leaders that are against the will of God. Now you think they came up with that on their own? No, this is connected. I'm trying to make a clear point here. This is connected to the, I just changed that one. This is connected to the prince of the power of the air. This is connected to the spirit of disobedience. He works in the lives of world leaders. Listen, when you get to Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and it talks about the whore of Babylon, and it talks about a seven headed dragon. And the seventh head has 11 horns. That's talking about the empires that have existed that have been influenced by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of disobedience through the ages of humanity that have come against God. This is the kings that it's talking about that are raging against the will of God and against the kingdom of God. That's what that is describing. And so I need you to know that this this spirit is moving in the world system. And it desires to manipulate and to cause deception. All right. That, that's really what I just wanted to see there because I was talking about world leaders. The spirit wants you to give in to its will. This, this spirit will, will not. It doesn't care whether you believe in God. It doesn't care whether you call yourself a Christian. It doesn't care whether you call yourself a church. This spirit is relentless. It's, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. It's in the church big time. And it will not quit. Just as God will, will, will pursue you, this spirit will also pursue you. It wants to make you give in to its will. It wants to make you agree with its ways. This spirit wants you to listen to the voice of the people of the world community. I don't know if you've been noticing this lately, but I see it. If I turn on a television show, community. Do you hear this word community being used a lot? But it's being used in the sense of the world coming together. This is no different than the spirit that moved at the Tower of Babel that caused them all to come together in opposition against God. The word community is built off of a common unity. The common unity that this is talking about is the world coming together as human beings and all helping one another as we as they move forward. What the difference between us is we are a community, but we our common unity is that we have believed in the plan of the father in the fact that he gave his son as a sacrifice for our sin and that when we put our faith in that sacrifice, Hallelujah. The old man died that used to be like them and a new man was resurrected and the spirit of God now lives on the inside of our lives. And that is the common unity that we have with one another. And that's why we take communion because we have a common union and it is in Christ. Hallelujah. And we worship God together as we worship him and remember what brought us together and what keeps us together. 
But I'm here to tell you that this is a pervasive thing going on right now because the spirit of Antichrist is causing the world to want to come together. Listen, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and we were talking about how young people, how young people now, their friends or their family. Have you ever noticed that? I've noticed it. Like I had friends when I was growing up, but I mean, look, they weren't tight like that. I mean, after a while you get tight. You know what I'm saying. Maybe you're not like me, but after a while, you know, come on, give me a break. Give me some space. Nowadays, dude, kids, they, they have their friends come before their family. It's like their new family unit. And this has been going on for a while. And that's what I'm trying to say. This is part of it. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's wrong to have friends. <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, though, is that they are building a common unity with one another. And this is their family and, and it's not built upon the things of God, but instead it's built upon their friendship and, and that they're getting something emotionally from these friendships. It's filling a void for their loneliness. This spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. It says, little children... It is the last time. I mean, he's talking about the last days. You know, since Jesus, since the advent of Jesus, really and truly, the last days started then. When Jesus showed up on the earth, this was the last days. He says, it is the last time. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. And what he's talking about there is that there is going to be a literal Antichrist that is going to come on the scene. I need you to know that. Some people try to say that there's no, there's going to be a literal antichrist that's going to come on the scene and he's going to, but he's going to fulfill. Look at this. Even now there are many antichrists. I didn't plan on necessarily right on the board, but what the scripture saying is that, that the, that there have been antichrists. Then there will be an antichrist. There will be an antichrist, but listen, what right now what we're talking about, there's also a spirit of Antichrist. A spirit that's pervasive in the land. But through the ages, what I need you to know is, is that there's been multiple types and shadows of Antichrist. I actually did a whole study one time on the Old Testament and even in the New Testament and types of world leaders and maybe not even world leaders, but characters in the Old Testament or New Testament that were types of the Antichrist. We're going to look at one of them. Today, the scripture describes the fact that the spirit we spoke of earlier that works in the children of disobedience. And like I said, the one that's been working through world leaders that have been types of the Antichrist. But there will be one that will one day show up. And one of the, the one that I'd like to look at right to this morning, a type of the Antichrist that's already been his name is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, some of you that like to read the Bible and study. You might be thinking in your head, hold on a second, preacher. Nebuchadnezzar gave his heart to the Lord. Remember that? Was anybody thinking that? You don't have to tell me if you were. but It's true. Nebuchadnezzar gave his heart to the Lord after God chastised him for seven years. He cursed him and he said, you're going to be like a cow and you're going to eat grass. And his fingernails grew all long and curly because he lost his mind and he went insane. And all of a sudden, his mind came back to him and he said, I glorify the God of heaven. Hallelujah. But until that day, thank you, Lord. But, but before then, Nebuchadnezzar was used by God, who was his enemy. He was the king of Babylon. God used him as a tool to bring judgment on his people. Amen. Now, I got to tell you something. God, you, you know, God's also going to use the Antichrist. That, that may mess up your theology. But God is ultimately sovereign and in control. Yes. God's going to allow the Antichrist to do what he's doing. If God didn't want, wasn't gonna allow, didn't want him to do what he was going to do, then God wouldn't let him do it. God is going to allow him to do what he's going to do to bring judgment on the world. Because th there's coming a day when mercy and grace is going to run out. And just as God used Nebuchadnezzar in that fashion... He's going to use the Antichrist. This is some attributes just to kind of explain to you why I'm saying Nebuchadnezzar is a type of the Antichrist. Nebuchadnezzar was a world leader. That's one. Nebuchadnezzar put God's people in bondage. 
the Antichrist will put God's people in bondage and the Antichrist will be a world leader. But also Nebuchadnezzar exalted himself and demanded that he be worshipped. So will the Antichrist. Point number one is this. The spirit of this world wants to make us drunk with what it offers. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. The spirit of this world wants to make us drunk with what it offers. In the year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Besieged means to assault, put in bondage, and to bring distress. Let's look at now verses 3 and 4 of Daniel chapter 1. And the king spoke unto Asphanaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes... Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. So, I mean, I've taught this many times. Maybe you were here. I'm sure you've read this many times. But, you know, one of the things that stands out to me is that what Nebuchadnezzar wanted was he wanted the best. He wanted the best of the children of, of Israel, and he wanted to bring them. And so what he did was he deported them from Jerusalem to Babylon. And I remember I did a little, I preached a message one time at the girls' school about Daniel. And I remember I Googled it. And I don't remember how many miles it is, but from what I remember, it's the same distance that it would be from Morgan City to San Antonio. They had, But they had to walk it. So if you get them, I don't even like driving to San Antonio. Can you imagine walking it? And that's what happened. He besieged the city. He said, these are the people that I want. He took these teenagers because he, we're going to talk about Daniel. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Teenagers. You, you think you got a hard time now, teenagers growing up in a world that doesn't like you. Imagine you putting yourself in this particular type of scenario. I mean, if you could just think about it for a second, if you think your life, I mean, I'm not saying that our life is never bad. I mean, we all go through things, but I'm just trying to say it's a whole different level of bad whenever another world ruler that's like the devil comes over there and steals you out of your home and brings you to a foreign land. But this is, this is a verse right here in the scripture that I never really noticed before. I don't think I did anyway. If I did, the Lord really brought it out to me this morning. He wanted me to see it. This next verse, it says, I'm sorry, let's see here. No, it's at the bottom right here. And whom, at the very bottom, comma, and, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. That really stuck out to me this morning. Because, see, I'm talking about the fact that the spirit of this world wants to make us drunk with what it's offering. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to teach these boys who belonged to God. These boys who belonged, who were the people of God. They wanted to teach them a new tongue. What does that mean? A new language. They wanted to teach them the language of the world. They wanted to assimilate them into their system. They wanted them to become more like them. They wanted them to be brought over there to their place, their neck of the woods with their new culture and with their new language. And they wanted them to become once again like them. Look at Daniel chapter one, verse five. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So nourishing them three years that at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. You know, the word nourishing there literally means to. To get the sustenance that you need to grow up. Now I realize that I'm kind of taking a literal thing that's happening here. And I'm kind of transitioning it into a spiritual concept. But it's not really that far of a jump. What the king was wanting to do was he was wanting these people to eat the food he was offering. And to drink the wine he was offering. Now the problem with his food and his wine is they had different practices. I just happened to do a little research this morning, and I never really researched this out this deeply before. But, you know, the children of Israel were not allowed to eat meat strangled. What does that mean? The way that they would dice or, or butcher the animal, the, the heathen nations, was that they would prevent the blood from being released from the body. To keep the blood in the muscles of the, of the animal. So that it was full of blood. 
The children of Israel, though, according to their law, were not allowed to eat with the blood. And as a matter of fact, what I found out this morning is kosher meats are meats that not only all the blood is let to drain out, but is also soaked in a particular type of solution that releases the blood out of the muscles. They're trying to get the blood out. Whereas in these heathen nations, they would strangle the, and keep the blood in. Daniel knew that there was a difference in their practices. The wine, I found this out this morning too, which I thought was really crazy, but in the old days, when they made wine, there was a sediment that was left in the wine, and one of the ways they could get that sediment out was by putting bull's blood in it. They put bull's blood in the wine, and it would cause the sediment to come out, all right? And so Daniel knew that their practices were different. You weren't allowed to drink blood, because once again, in the book of Leviticus, what we learn is, is that whenever they would eat meats that were strangled, they would partake of the blood, they would drink of the blood. These were all occult rituals. The main point that I'm trying to make, though, is this. Daniel knew God's word. Daniel knew that God's word said that you weren't supposed to do certain things. And this worldly system was trying to convince Daniel and his people that it was going to be okay. One of the other, but it says right here in verse 8, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, if you've read the story before, you know that he asked for a certain diet of vegetables. And listen, man, the church has done gone all oh, this due to Daniel fast. Let's just eat vegetables and all this stuff. Fine. There's nothing wrong with eating vegetables, but you're completely missing the point. There's a spiritual point to be made here. And it's not just about you eating vegetables so that you can lose weight and do some kind of Daniel fast. The reality of it is, is that Daniel did not want to defile himself and go contrary to the word of God that he knew was God's will according to God's ways. Amen. But everybody was doing it. The Bible says that Daniel is the one that stood up and said, hey, I don't want to defile myself. I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. Do you realize that there were a whole bunch of other Hebrew boys in there that didn't raise their hand and say, hey, I don't want to do that? One of the things that I realized about Daniel was that he knew what the word of God said and he knew what they were asking him to do was contrary. The stand that he was taking was built upon the fact that they wanted him to eat what was against God's word. You know, there's much wrong. I'm kind of transitioning here. There's much wrong in the church today. And I believe that a big part of it is that the church is ignorant of the word of God. Amen. I don't know if you would agree with me on that or That's not. Right. I'm not really de demanding or even asking that you agree with me. I'm telling you, I believe this with all my heart. This is my position. I'm not going to change it. I believe that the, word, that the church, for the most part, is really ignorant about the word of God. That's right. And I don't mean that ugly. Most people sit in pews in churches and they, they're fed a certain diet and they don't really know any different for themselves. And I know I've heard Brother Swigert say before that very seldom do the people in a church ever raise, raise to a level higher than the understanding of the, of the preaching that they're receiving. It's not that it never happens, but it's just typically not going to happen. And so they sit there and they're being fed a dose of, of a word that is not truly built upon the word of God. The church is ignorant and is being prepared for deception. See, what I need you to understand is, is that I also believe it's not accidental ignorance. I believe it's purposeful. I don't believe that the way that the church is today and the ignorance of how people really have been dumbed down. You know, this is another thing that I don't apologize for. I don't apologize for getting deep in the word of God. There's going to be some people that are going to show up at this church that don't like the way I preach. There's going to be some people that are going to show up over here. Dude, you're getting too deep. I've had people complain about that before. But you know one thing that I got, and I hope that if the guy that said this is, happens to ever watch the video, that you don't get offended. But what they told me was, you need to teach the Bible at a third grade level. That is, that is an atrocity. Yes. Yes. What, we want a bunch of third grade Christians running around? So at some point in time, we have to become to a place of maturity. Oh, I like the way he preaches. He colors it in crayon for me. That was always a slight to try to slap me in the face. You're going too deep. I like the way the preacher does it. He colors it in crayon for me. The truth to be told is that the word of God needs to be dug into. It needs to be rightly divided. And we need to be willing to get it into our hearts so that we can understand it the way that Daniel understood it. 
so that we're not deceived by the lies that are creeping into the church. There's been a planned scheme by the spirit of Antichrist to deceive the church into thinking that it needs to be modern and relevant. The brain has been trained to believe that big and flashy is success because in the world we live in, that's what it looks like. Look, I, I pick on him a lot, but I, I don't really mind. Joel Osteen, everybody thinks that because his church had 20,000 people in it, that it was of the Lord. I'm here to tell you that he didn't preach the gospel. Amen. At the best, he was a motivational speaker. I know I said that last week. I don't mean to keep doing it every week. But truth be told, I believe that. And, and the way that the, that the world does things, it has a certain flair to it. And we all get caught up in it. We like the way certain clothing looks. We like the way certain cars. I'm guilty of that. I look at one car and I'm like, and it could cost forty five thousand dollars. I look at another car, it costs forty five thousand dollars. I'm like, man, I'm all about that one. I don't like that one. That's right. I know my car doesn't cost forty five thousand dollars, and I, but but my point is, I understand. I feel like I have at least my opinion on what I think looks good, right? And we all run into that. But the world, we're being inundated by the world to say this is good, this is bad, <clears throat> and they want us to see it their way. They want us to be nourished by what they're offering, because as we're nourished by what they're offering, we, we, we start to grow up their way. Yep. We, we grow up on their food, you, you get my point, their, on their ways, we grow up on their ways, it begins to infiltrate our mind and our heart and it begins to affect the way that we think. There's no going back. I got to tell you, there's no going back for the church in this case. <laughs> this is the course of the world that much of the world has been I use this word. I made up a word this morning. Tsunami. The, the church has been tsunami by this deception. I know tsunami is a noun, but it, I just turned it into a verb because this lie has washed over the church and there's no going back from it. The destruction. There is no going back. From, there's, I'm not saying there's not a remnant. I'm not saying that there's not a people of God like Daniel that will stand strong in the midst of this tsunami. But what I'm trying to say is, is that the course of the world has swept what we see and what everybody sees as the church into this tidal wave. And there's no returning back. It's not going to wash back up on the shore the way it was supposed to be. No, it's going to continue to float out and it's going to get worse and worse as we get closer and closer to the end. And there's going to continue to be a remnant that's going to hold on to the truth. Amen. Amen. It's built on methods to make people feel good. This, this tsunami church is built on methods to make people feel good. A sense of community and purpose like we talked about. The wine and meat of Nebuchadnezzar would have made them feel good, but it wasn't what was best for them. And the church has moved away from a pursuit of the truth, moved away from the message that it preaches, and moved towards replacing it with a bunch of methods. Okay, I got I to gotta tell you this story. Now, I might have told you this story before, but one time... At the old church I was going to, y'all just bear with me this morning. This is gonna, I mean, I got, I don't have too much longer to go, but anyway, we were driving to church in, in, in the old church we used to go to, and I used to always fuss about this kind of stuff in the car, you know, because I could see modernism creep. Because I'm doing all this research, I had a conversation with a guy in the gym yesterday. He's a Christian. He goes to a church. And I mean, dude, I start getting all loud. I'm like preaching up in the gym, you know. And I mean, he was cool with it, but I said, and I was talking about this, the the modern church. And, you know, how everybody's mindset, and I know he didn't completely agree with me, but I, so I preached it even harder. The modern church says that we got to be relevant. Well, what does their, their idea of relevance even mean? Anyway, I used to fuss about this, and we were driving to the church, and on the way, Isabella said, Dad, uh, I'm kind of getting uncomfortable in youth group. Now, I don't really know what her motives were, but anyway, that's what she said. Dad, I'm kind of getting uncomfortable in youth group. It's starting to feel like a club. I was like, oh, okay. So I was on, I was in the elder board over there. I was like one of the big boys, right? So I dropped them off at, at church, and then I kind of, I kind of sne sneak in the back. And what I walk into is all the lights are down. There's some neon lights up at the stage. There's this huge crowd of kids, and there's this music that's going boom, 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 boom. Now, this 
wasn't their worship service. This was beforehand. This is whenever they're all just coming in to congregate. And I haven't even been in a club in a whole long time, but I would imagine that that's exactly what they look like nowadays. This bass-driven beat that was booming like that, these neon lights, dark, and this huge old crowd almost looked like a mosh pit. I mean, they weren't moshing, but... <laughs> So I, was, I said, wow, man, it, it kind of does look like a club. I found out later, and I don't know if this is true, but I found out and somebody told me that later on they actually started stamping their hands. Wow. What? I don't know if it continued, but nevertheless, you get the point. So I went back over there after church service, and I approached the youth leader, and I kind of knew him from a long, long time ago. He actually used to work for me. I approached the youth leader, and I said, and, and I knew that, but this is just the way I do it. I'm like, you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you, but I'm going to say it. I believe that you're preparing these kids to be comfortable more in a club than they will ever be comfortable in a church. Should have seen his face. I got to kind of commend the guy. I doubt he'll ever watch one of my videos, but if you do, at least you stood up. But the problem was, was that he stood up from a point of ignorance. But he was, he was a man, and he definitely didn't cower back. And he said, basically what he told me was, I don't, you don't know what you're talking about. And this was his reasoning. And it makes a little bit of sense if you look at it from a worldly perspective. If you look at it from the flash and the way that the world says success looks. In his mind, he's thinking, you're one. I keep calling myself chubby. I was kind of chubby then. You're one chubby guy, old dude maybe. Maybe thought I was old. From South Louisiana. He said, man, everybody's doing this. The whole church is doing it. <laughs> the whole denomination is doing this. In his mind, he was looking at me like, you fool. Who do you even think that you are? What are you even talking about? And I just told him, I said, I don't really care what everybody else is doing. It doesn't mean it's right just because everybody else is doing it. And I'm not trying to say that I'm like Daniel. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that all them other Hebrew boys were going to be perfectly fine with eating the king's meat and drinking the king's wine. But Daniel said, no, I don't want to defile myself with that. And that's just one example of what I was trying to describe to you of what's going on in the church. That's just the way they do youth ministry. That's not talking about the way they water down the message and they don't even get to the main point of what the gospel is all about. That points out the fact that man is separate from God because of his sin, but that God has one way that you can approach him, and it's the gift that he gave in his son Jesus. And that the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. And they change that message into some practical, watered-down, diluted version that speaks to people's felt needs. But you don't understand, this is what I'm going through today, preacher. And I'm going through this in my house. I'm going through this in my struggle. Well, good. Same answers for that. God wrote a prescription. His name is Jesus. And what you need to hear is hallelujah. What you need to hear is if you'll get a hold of this Jesus, you don't need me to walk you through each and every minute of your day. Why? Because you will be able to hold on to him and he will walk you through every minute of your day. But let me just tell you another thing. There's also a control spirit in the church. This isn't in my notes, but while we're on it, Preachers don't want to preach the truth. Pre if a preacher knew, they, first off, they don't know the truth. I know this guy didn't agree with me yesterday. And people that I talk to at work, I, I, give, I give up trying to talk to people because they just, yep. people think that they, and whatever, they probably think the same thing about me. But, <laughs> but, but my point is, is this, most of the time that they don't know the truth. But if they did know the truth, they would be, they would not like what the truth would do. And you know why? Because the truth would liberate their people. You can't control. The, the truth would liberate their people to where they would be able to access God for themselves. They would no longer be able to control the people. Do you, do you realize how much of a spirit of control there is in the Protestant church? Do you realize how guilty people? I've had people come over here just to visit one time. Just to, just to, I mean, not saying that they're even going to like what they hear, but just came to visit, man. I just want, but I feel guilty. I'm like, dude, why do you feel guilty? I'm not asking, I never even asked you to come to this church, but you came over here because you wanted to hear what we were saying, and you feel guilty like you're cheating on your pastor or something? Dude, there's a control spirit behind that. 
If you feel like you need to go out there and taste the flavor of what's going on, you're free to go. If you feel, I, I don't, how can you control somebody? How can you tell somebody where they can go and where they can't go? If you're preaching the truth, hallelujah, then they ought to be able to know the difference. Amen. 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 Praise God. But that's what happens is that there's a control spirit. And that's one of the beauties of the message of the cross it teaches people to access God for themselves. Amen. Not saying that we don't ever need friends in the body. Not saying that, that iron doesn't sharpen iron and that we don't grow together as a family in Christ. Amen. That's not what I'm saying. But you, we don't need the preacher to, to minutely control every little detail of our lives. I don't want to do that. Please don't ask me to do that. <laughs> Amen. I mean, the truth is, is that you know, you may you may need prayer. You may need somebody to come visit you in the hospital or a family member. Call me up, please. Y'all got my number. I'm, I'll go pray. Amen. But but also, just like I have to access God when I'm going through something, you, you need to learn how to access That's God. Right. Amen. That's There's right. one mediator between man and God, the man Christ oh, Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. All right. That's the example. But the world wants to get us drunk. The world wants to get us drunk with the things that it's offering. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 8. It says, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that are right unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. See, the church of Thessalonica thought that the rapture had already taken place. And so Paul was writing to them about that. But it says, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child. They shall not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. You remember that song we sang, light of the world, you came down in the darkness. You opened my eyes so I could see. So you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. The day, same thing as the light. You are not of the night. Jesus said, I must work while it is day. Daytime light, right? He said, and, and, and he says, you're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope for salvation. Jesus said, work while it's day. See, Point number two is this. Once we're drunk with what he offers, the compromise just continues. Once we're drunk with what he offers, the compromise just continues. Look at Daniel chapter three, verse one. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. You know how much that is? Anybody remember what a score is? Huh? Twenty scores, 20. Three scores, 60. 60. There's one six. And the breadth of it was six cubits. There's two sixes. There's another sign right there, in my opinion, anyway. That's not an accident that he's a type of the Antichrist. Two sixes, the number of man. See, the thing, the reason why it's 666 is that it's, is that it is a fulfillment of the number six, which was the day that God created man. And it says in the book of Revelation that it's the number of a man. Why? Because this is the ultimate fulfillment of this world community that we're talking about, the spirit of disobedience that's working in humanity to elevate themselves above the knowledge of God. And this is how the enemy has been working through mankind to try to come against and oppose God all of these years. He said he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Look at Revelation 13, 11 through 15. So Nebuchadnezzar made an image. It says, and I beheld another beast came up out of the earth. I'm just letting you know this is talking about the false prophet right here. He had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. Do you see how deceitful that is? Look like a lamb, but he's speaking with the mouth of a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast, which was the Antichrist, before him, who is a world leader. And this false prophet is a religious leader. And he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. So the false prophet tells everybody to worship the Antichrist, whose deadly wound was healed. He died, but he false resurrection. And he doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, 
that they should make an image to the beast. Same thing Nebuchadnezzar did. Make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Back to Daniel chapter 3, verses 4 and 7. Then a herald cried aloud. This is like the false prophet we just read, read about in the book of Revelation right there. To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whosoever, whoso falleth not down and worships, shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, i got to tell you that there was all but three, uh, three that did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The other three Hebrew boys that were friends with Daniel. When everybody else, when all the rest of the world were falling down, they did what Daniel did and they separated themselves and they refused to worship. You know, this isn't okay. Right? We, we know that this isn't okay, but, but, but let me tell you something. A physically drunk man, because our first point was that the world wants to get us drunk. And the second one is that once we're drunk, the compromise worsens. A physically drunk man becomes unaware of his surroundings. you agree with that? I know I've been drunk too many times to talk about it. Physically drunk man becomes unaware of his surroundings. His speech is slurred. His vision is blurred. His perception is dulled. When Christians are part of a church that has forsaken the message for a method, they become spiritually undiscerning and incapable of perceiving what's happening around them. We live in perilous times right now. Before our very eyes, the world has changed rapidly. Right? But it's doing it slow enough at a slow enough pace that like a frog in cold water under a small flame, we're being slowly torn by the serpent into thinking that the changes of the world are okay to embrace. The lies of society are making people drunk and the music of the world is playing and people are already bowing down what the world says is okay. And it's the very things that God's word said are not okay. They didn't eat what the world offered. They didn't reverence the ways of the world. We're seeing society change before our very eyes. And I know I'm, for the most part, preaching to the choir, but we have to be aware of the fact that it's happening all around us. And you know what the sad thing is? Is that it will begin to affect your children long before you ever even realized it. Yep. They, they're, they're, I'm telling you right now, they affect your kids in so many ways through the cartoons and the shows that they play on television. I, I mean, I don't even have time to get into all that. I know I've told the story before, but one time I was walking through, I think it was Hannah Montana was on the TV. And you'd think Disney's safe, and we won't get into that. And Han I don't know if it was Hannah Montana or somebody else, but they were sassing their mama or sassing their daddy or something. And I said, whoa, pause that. And I remember telling Isabella, I don't know that this really worked that well, but I tried. I hope she never watches the video. I said, I know that I'm letting you watch Disney, but can I tell you one thing? That is not the way it's supposed to be. And if you talk like that up in my house and back talk me like that, we're going to have a problem. It's no, but it's not okay for a child to back talk their parent. But yet, on a daily basis, the children are watching children back talk their parent. And nowadays, in almost every TV sitcom that's going on, you got a gay relationship. I'm telling you, there was a time whenever they, they would have never done that. Listen, if you want to really see something, you Google this YouTube video because it's very well done. The Satanic Influence on Hollywood. You Google that. It's going to start off with some dude sitting down by a computer, but then he's going to, because he, I guess he wants to get all the hits on his YouTube or whatever. But then he goes into this very well-produced video about Hollywood. And Alistair, well, anyway, I don't want to get into all that. Alistair Crowley's influence on Hollywood, not just the music industry. Yep. And how they slowly, like a frog in cold water with a flame, have progressively increased 
and inundated society with all of these things. And it influences people's minds. So they were made drunk. Drunk people are lost and don't know. They, they lose their perception. But they didn't eat what the world offered. I'm about to close. And that brings me to my last point. Point number three. Daniel is an example for all believers of no compromise. Well, I'm just going to tell you the story for sake of time because I'm definitely running over. You remember the story. This is a new king. His name is Darius, but it's the same kingdom and it's the same spirit. Daniel is now an old man. He's risen to the top of their society. He's in charge of a lot of different things. And there's a whole lot of leaders in that government that aren't from where Daniel's from. And they hate Daniel. They're envious of him. And they want to trap him. And the conclusion that they've come to is that they can't find any dirt on Daniel. And then, wouldn't that be a good thing if they could never find any dirt on us? They said the only way that they're ever good, we're ever going to get Daniel is if we try to trick him up and make him go against his God. Then we'll get him. So what they did was they wrote a petition. Said so for the next 30 days, anybody that prays or brings a petition before any other God <laughs> other than you, O King Darius, let him go into the lion's den. Darius, not really realizing what they were doing, he goes ahead and he strike, puts his little signet on there and he says it's okay. And so sure enough, but you know what ends up happening? Daniel, the Bible says, Daniel did as he always did. I don't know if he went over there and he opened up the window, but the Bible says that he did what he always did. With the windows open, he turned and he prayed towards Jerusalem. In the midst of all that, we know the rest of the story. They catch him and they throw him in the lion's den. But the main point I wanted to make to you was is that Daniel, even though society was changing around him, even though society was trying to tell him to go in opposition to what the word of God always told him, Daniel stood strong. He was a man of no compromise. And what he did was he stuck to his guns and he served the God that he had always known. Listen, four, three things real quick. Daniel offers us an example of what it looks like to be a no compromise follower of God in the middle of a wicked society. When times are perilous and wickedness abounds, I just put this right here, look towards Jerusalem. The reason I put that is, and there's a lot of depth to this, is that there's repeated terminology used in the Old Testament. David would say whenever he was running at one point in time, how I long to be in, your, in the courts of your temple. Jonah, when he was in the mouth, the belly of the whale, you know what he said? He said, I was going down. So now, he, he, now he's reflecting on how he was thrown overboard and how he was about to die. He said, I was going down. I was sinking down. And he, and he said the seaweed was wrapped all around his head. And he says, I turned towards Jerusalem. Now, how he found his way, he doesn't mean physically. He doesn't mean he physically turned towards Jerusalem. What he's talking about is, that's your city. That's the city of peace. That's the place where your temple dwells. That's the place where your presence is. When you find yourself in the midst of perilous times, turn your face towards the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. When the world says, this is point number two, when the world says that wickedness is good, the followers of God ignore the lie. It's never God's will to stop what his word says to do and instead do it the way the world says to do it. Amen? Amen? And when the world says to stop serving God the right way, there is a remnant. There is a remnant Amen. that wants to follow after God and refuses to bow down and to be nourished by what it is that the world is offering. So in a world that is full of turbulence and commotion, where the spirit of Antichrist is trying to cause deception and change the purpose of the church, we as believers have to be reminded about how precious the word of God really is. Amen. Without a proper revelation of God's word is people will be deceived to exchange the truth for a lie to look for a feel good method instead of holding on to his perfect this perfect word.